uh, this particular session, Relationships That Matter, How Mentoring and Group Coaching Can Transform Workplaces. And when we were, Lisa and I were sort of putting this series together, one of the things that we've been noticing was that within our own clients, those that had really developed a strong mentoring and coaching culture within their organization seem to be kind of navigating the pan pandemic with a lot more ease. And so, you know, we were kind of curious thinking, I wonder why that's happening. I wonder what's been going on there to kind of um, really allow these companies to make some transitions more, more successfully than some of the other clients that we've worked with. And, you know, from my own observation, I thought I'd share, you know, a little bit of um, why group coaching from the group perspective, group coaching and um, group mentoring and team coaching why we're seeing companies that have had a lot of that kind of in play, but even if you didn't, why the, you know, as a, as a tool and an approach, it's a really strong one right now. And there's, there's kind of four things that I think have been whirling around, whether we were in a pandemic or not. One of the things that's been on the books for all of us in organizations, I think for quite some time, has been this notion of, um, you know, we're in, in an age of complexity and there's so much data. We have so much access to all this data, which is great, but it can also be really overwhelming. So when you look at the implication from a learning perspective is you want to connect learners with other people who know and understand how to read data. So this, we see across organizations often the word collaboration. We need people to be collaborating more. Well, part of the reason why we need them collaborating more is that it's really hard to keep up with all of the complexity at work. So that's one big theme that's really led to a, a shift towards more of a group-based approach. The other thing that we're seeing is, um, you know, the, the uncertainty that's out there. And with uncertainty comes a need to be agile and to be nimble and to pivot. And almost connected to that is this need to be innovative. So those pieces together, again, when you bring more people together, when you're all collectively sharing insights and knowledge and you're working towards things together, again, lends itself to this sort of group-based um, approach. And then finally, and I think this is the piece that I've certainly seen in the work that we've been doing lately, because I really think it came to a head during the pandemic, honestly, is for many years, we've been getting more and more isolated at work. We've become more and more transactional and we've taken a uh, kind of a focus away from community and onto performance output and as a result uh, certainly i'm talking to you um, as you know from toronto canada um, we've seen mental health things just continue to go up um, you know in terms of priorities within organizations loneliness people feeling isolated and now we've got this times I think a thousand with the pandemic because you have so many people that are feeling socially disconnected, socially isolated. And group and team, again, these sort of more collective approaches, which is what we talked about last time, looking at, you know, how do you bring a more collective approach to development, which is different than training, um, allows people to really grow. So I think that's certainly what I've seen around, um, you know, uh, how these modes of developing people have amplified during a pandemic. Um, would love to sort of hear, Lisa, from you, if there's anything else that you would add to that that you're seeing. Yeah, um, I will. And um, we did have a question if you can get the recording from last session. Absolutely, we'll uh, make sure to share uh, those links as well. Um, yeah. In fact, um, let me just ask uh, Michelle Hancock on my team if you could grab that link from YouTube. Um, and put that uh, in the chat uh, to ask that in a sec. Um, what are we seeing? Interesting. I'm seeing One is a, a, at least an initial reluctance to reach out to mentoring partners with mentors or mentees saying, I want to give people space because I know they're dealing with a lot, which is really interesting, um, which is really interesting as well. And um, I'm really trying to coach people through that because um, it's an interesting thing because sometimes the, the attempts to have a space, I always want to grant that, but the 
assumption that mentoring partners need space or mentoring team mentoring should be paused um, is often interpret, interpreted, um, filled in the, the, the vacuum gets filled in, right, as a lack of attentiveness. Um, and so I'm, I, that is sort of been one initial reaction. And the other is the opposite, is um, really to start to, to do more reaching out, to feel that need, to have that connection. And a lot of organizations are finding that people are doing in our are um, forming informal networks um, without the structure. And they're looking for a way to leverage that because the people really are looking for that connection. I don't know about you, Glyn, but when the pandemic first hit, there were a million, uh, very welcome, by the way, uh, virtual happy hours or virtual connections, uh, that kind of thing, people really filling that need. And what's wonderful, people are seeing that in the workplace where they're creating an intimacy they haven't had before, but they're, they're not, they don't really have a way to leverage that. Um, because they don't have some of the formality of the, mo the modes that you and I have been talking about as well. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and it's, it's so, I think one of the things that I think we're going to explore today, which I think is um, a great sort of bridge in, is what do you, you know, it's, it's really um, to make these relationships work through times that are, you know, I mean, let's talk about it for unprecedented, really, a pandemic. It's not like you can prepare for it. But, the, you know, there's certain pillars, I think, that really allow it to work more smoothly and, and maybe negate some of these or mitigate some of these challenges that you've seen in terms of, uh, you know, people's reluctance or things like that. If we can get certain foundations in place, I think we have a better, better chance at these programs sustaining in good times and in bad. And I think that was one of the things that we were keen to talk about with everybody today is a little bit of getting it into the building blocks. You know, what are the, mm -hmm. what are the best practices? What are the foundational things that, um, you know, really need to happen? So what we'd love to hear from you guys is if given that context for today's session, you know, foundations of successful mentoring relationships, foundations for successful group or team coaching programs, what would you like to know? What would give you the most value? And perhaps you can pop that into the chat. I know we've had a couple come in already. Um, I think I saw you coming in earlier. Um, when this mm -hmm. was up. But um, feel free to put it in. What, what, what are the questions that you'd like to know about um, what you need to have in place to make things uh, really work? Yeah. So one came in uh, a little bit earlier, Glyn, which is a topic that we talk about in depth in session number one. So Brian, encourage you to click on that. But let's just talk about what folks are thinking about ways that they could get value today, which is how does team coaching different from the action learning series? You want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, well, I don't know that it is different really, Brian. I think, I think the thing with, um, with, uh, I suppose the differentiate, well, actually I shouldn't say it's not different. So with a team coaching experience, you're taking an intact team and you're taking them on a journey as a team. They are developing together. They are working together. And it's often very much in combination with the business issues that they need to be addressing and that they are being challenged with. With action learning, I see a group coaching process typically applied in an action learning context. So often when we're, um, you know, so for example, one of our programs, it's, it's essentially um, a group coaching program that has an action learning component that's really driven around helping leaders be more successful in, um, you know, their, their leadership uh, requirements and priorities and what they need to be showing up and doing. So that's to me how I would separate the two. Um, I think teams you're looking, so is there action learning within a team? Absolutely, because they're applying it to the work that needs to be done. When we take a group, a cross-functional group of leaders or managers or even frontline employees together and we put them through a group experience, there's an action learning component um, to that as well. But team, team is about the intact team and who's in the group as opposed to uh, individuals who may be from completely different departments just coming together with the, the shared learning component. Yeah. All right. Thing. Well, I don't see any other questions. So just want to encourage folks um, to uh, continue to add questions into the chat um, as well. Uh, wait, here's a Q and A that uh, a question that came into Q and A. So thanks for that. Suggestions on building a strong mentoring relationship. We are all going a thousand miles an hour, including our mentor. Mm. Whoa! Fantastic, fantastic question um, and actually a perfect segue to what we'll talk about in terms of the mentoring cycle. So um, 
Uh, the key barb to that question, and thank you for asking it, is the idea of intentionality. And, um, you know, one of the key components of the mentoring cycle, which I'll take you through in just a second, is um, this idea of negotiation, negotiating or establishing agreements. Not to worry if you haven't done that with your um, mentee yet. Now is a really good time, um, particularly to revisit that. But that, I think, will help um, us look through that. So let me see if I can just advance us here. Here's, here are the building blocks of the mentoring cycle. And I know Glenn's gonna take you through something similar for coaching as well. Um, and I think Barb, this will help answer your question. How do you really do this when you're going a million miles an hour? So at Center for Mentoring Excellence, what we have is we use this mentoring model, which was developed by our founder, Lois Zachary, um, which is premised on the fact that there really are four distinct phases to every successful mentoring relationship. And sometimes these happen organically. More likely, though, they happen with intentionality. And so what you see is first this idea of preparation or getting ready, which is both about self-awareness and about getting to know one another. It has to happen. This is where I would suggest if you feel like you're going a million miles a minute um, to, to go back to and revisit if you have an existing mentoring relationship or in a new one to, to spend some time in. The negotiating phase is where you and your mentoring partner will talk about what your expectations are of one another in terms of the amount of time in which you meet, uh, the length of time, where, who initiates conversations, what sorts of things are you going to be talking about. It can be quite fluid um, as, as you see the arrows between the, these phases um, are two ways. So sometimes you have to go back and revisit a phase, but it provides the ground the foundation for these mentoring relationships. And often in when I do workshops or I talk to clients, this is the phase that I get the most pushback on. Um, and so I'm just moving my mic up, uh, thumbs up if you can hear a little bit, hear me a little bit better, uh, Glenn, perfect. Yep. Um, so often what happens here in this phase is that I get a lot of pushback on these uh, on this phase because people are used to forming relationships that feel more informal and it feels very um, forced to, to what we call negotiate. And yet it is really the most powerful thing that mentoring partners can do or mentoring circles, right? If you're gonna do a, a group mentoring modality to sit and talk about what is it that's gonna govern our relationship because it will keep you on track in the long run. So if you feel like you're going a million miles a minute and you don't have, um, the time to devote that you once taught, once anticipated, revisiting that establishing agreement phase, the negotiating phase, can be a really powerful way to do it. The next phase is enabling growth. This is where you facilitate the learning. You're doing goal setting and goal getting. It's really a meaty, meaty part of the mentoring relationship. Remember what we talked about last week which is that mentoring is developmental and it's really focused on goals. So a lot of your time will happen here. Very frequently, we do see people going back to the negotiating phase, sometimes even back to the preparing phase when they realize that they don't know enough about each other. And the final phase is the phase of coming to closure, which is really about how do you look backwards on what celebrate uh, what you've learned, appreciate the learning from one another and determine how you're gonna move forward through the mentoring relationship. So those are the building blocks uh, of the mentoring cycle. Mm, nice. Glenn, so what comes up for you from that? Yeah, so why don't we go to, why, why don't we kind of go through the building blocks for group coaching? Or, and we talk about like the arc of group coaching. And um, there's really sort of two axes and it's really, you know, how much time has the group been together? And, and how then deep does the relationship go? So when, when you first bring a group together, they're all kind of, you know, uh, getting to know each other. And so um, we can just pull up the steps, Lisa, I think, and you'll see a lot of parallel to what Lisa just talked you through. In the group context, it's a little bit different in that, you know, you're, you're establishing the relationship as a group. And so we talked last time that we were, last week when we were together about the importance of things like confidentiality agreements, working ground rules up front with the group, helping the group build vulnerability and psychological safety very quickly, very early on. Because when you're in a group program, it's usually very defined. Um, I know our anchor program, it's eight sessions. They're in, they're out uh, over the course of 11 months. So you really need to get that established relationship locked down very quickly through you know, various methods. 
And then you're setting the direction for the group with the group. And that's again where it's a little bit different. The group is more participatory. Um, they're, they're sharing their individual goals, but there's also some collective goals from the group. And from a coaching perspective, those of us that coach groups, you know, this is really where the agility um, comes into play, as opposed to a defined training program where we've got our learning objectives and we're taking people through a really set of things. I always think with group coaching, you kind of have your roadmap, but you have to be prepared to take some detours. Because if three months into your program, the company gets sold or three months into your program, which is what happened to us, you hit a pandemic, guess what? Things are going to have to pivot. And so that's where, you know, when we're in the working space and by that kind of working the plan space, we've got some agility to be able to adapt in terms of what's needed, but also the group is really taking ownership of the experience. And in, in our um, organization, we'll always say that by the third session, we want to see the group having gelled. So you can almost think of like, Establishing the relationship and setting the group direction is what will happen in uh, session one and two. And by session three, they're really starting to work the plan. They get to understand the rhythm. They know how they're all showing up. And then um, by the end of the session, and this is what's really an interesting thing I think about group coaching, is that you really have, by the end of an experience, um, a fully formed high-performing team. Which is, which is interesting. And so for some companies that we've worked with, they've really sort of taken this group experience and then been able to take those individuals who've been part of a leadership development program and put them against a, um, a project or an issue that the organization is looking to solve. But, but, but when we bring it back into the context of a program, just like with um, Lisa's model, you're really looking at giving you know, some reflection to the journey because one of the things, and I'm curious, Lisa, if you find this with um, mentoring as well, what I find with group coaching is often when learners are in this process, they actually don't recognize just how much they've learned. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a slow drip accumulating process with group coaching. And so it's really critical at the back end that there is time for reflection. And so our entire final session has no content in it. The entire session is on reflection, helping them pull together the learnings and helping them then think about how are they gonna maintain momentum following this experience that they've just been through. So really there's an arc to it at the end, you know, we've got this very high performing team, but it's really critical in terms of these pillars for success that you really think about helping learners consolidate the journey they've been on because they'll forget. Because the, the thing I know about the, the folks that we work on is they've got a to-do list that's way long and they will constantly be looking at, well, I didn't do this and I haven't gotten to that yet and I haven't gotten there yet. And so you have to take them back to that point A of where they started on the journey. How, how, how yeah, does that line up with you for mentoring? Yeah, I mean, it's amazing to me how these, these really do line up quite well. The reflection is really critical. And, you know, in my experience, the same is true really in group mentoring. Um, as you mentioned in group coaching, because many times somebody has some, some, in some modalities, they call it a hot seat, sometimes a stage for somebody who has a pressing issue. Yeah. And, you know, in the effective, when, when the facilitation is good, or the mentoring is good, or the coaching is good, what, what happens is that the other participants really learn as much uh, as the person who has that hot seat. And so, yeah. so the reflection becomes critical because sometimes you might hear from a participant, well, you know, I can't really remember what I learned on, or I learned on my particular issue, but the learning really is, um, does happen as much or more uh, with others as well. The reflection's critical to put a point on that. And we do that, that's what the closure piece is really all about. That's really what I was talking about here is it's really reflecting on the learning, reflecting on the growth. We also sometimes do, you know, a Delta analysis of what was it like when we started? Yes. Uh, and what was it like when we finished? Um, you know, we start the, we start the mentoring process with sort of a from to here's where I am, here's where I want to go. And then you do the Delta analysis at the end and it can be really powerful, um, to really see where that transition is. Sometimes the growth is in the areas in which they were, uh, intended and sometimes they were in other areas as well. It's super exciting. Yeah. And I think the thing too, like when we, when we're in the one-to-one -one mentoring relationship, there's often this point where the, the two individuals are you know, co-creating together. And as you said, you know, you're going back to the working agreements, right? And you're revisiting things to see, is this still where we need to be heading? What needs to shift in terms of how we're working together? And 
in a group experience for us, I mean, we have those sorts of, we, you have to build in those sort of check-in moments with your group. And, and we do do it very formally in the middle of our program where we really are shifting the um, responsibility because I think of the, I think in a group coaching program, it's like it's like with any sort of coaching. You know, when I when I work with an individual individually, I can't do the work for them as a coach. It is up to them to do it, and it's the same in a group um, coaching experience where, really, the coach is there to guide the group through the experience. But it is up to the group to take ownership of this learning, which is which is very. I find quite an adjustment for learners to make because it's, you know, they're used to kind of having the, the stage on the stage, the sage on the stage at the front of the room with all the knowledge who's imparting this wisdom. And yet in a group experience, you really are tapping into the wisdom of everybody around the table. And um, our groups do use this phrase hot seat when you're on the hot seat um, with your issue. And it is the collective learning that you get from everybody in the group not right i really don't see it as being the responsibility of the coach i feel the coach's responsibility is to to pull it out and top it up when needed and direct when needed but really it's that collective ability so halfway through we have a survey that we get the group to say what's working what's not working about the group what do we want to do differently so it's a it's a co-creation of the experience as opposed to a, a kind of a more directive approach yeah, that ongoing feedback is so, so, so critical. And this actually gets to Barb's question as well. Another thing to do when you feel like you're moving a million miles a minute is to do the thing that seems counterintuitive, which is to stop and slow down and do a check-in and say, you know, what's working, what's not working, what needs to be changed based on where we are, um, and really to do that reflection. And the, the key to having that happen is at the outset of the relationship to set that expectation of ongoing feedback. Because otherwise you have that feeling, you know, I don't know about you, but if somebody says to me out of the blue, can I give you feedback? I know what's coming, right? <laughs> right. I'm like, I brace for the sucker punch, right? Yes. Um, but if, if, if there's a relate, if there's an ongoing relationship of, you know, what do you, what do you need? What's working? What can I do differently? You know, are we going to continue to check in? You don't have that brace for feedback. You lean into it and you really want to offer uh, ways to, to change and evolve. So um, I think there's a, a real similarity in the coaching and the mentoring well, modality think, there. You know, and I think the other thing too, just on that note, because I can remember, um, you know, because we ran a mentoring program, we don't run it anymore. But when I started the business, we had a one-to-one -one mentoring matching program that we did for leaders in organizations with executives outside of their organization. And I can remember when I was doing research about mentoring programs, what did people like and what they what didn't they like? And one of the things that uh, senior executives would say to me that they didn't like about mentoring programs was, it's really hard to get rid of your mentee. Once you're once you're once you have somebody like, how do you tell somebody, no, I don't want to meet with you anymore? So I think I think we, you know I think the, the thing for all of us to really think about with these programs and implement, implementing them in, it is really important to have that closure piece. And I think if, if groups decide to move on, it's also important that they think about reimagining what the relationship's going to look like when they move on. Because in group programs, our, our program is every six weeks, you're meeting three, for three hours if you're doing the live version. If it's, if it's um, web-based, it's a different sort of format, but it's still on a particular rhythm. And I'll, I've seen some of our graduating groups want to maintain momentum, and so they try and keep it on that rhythm, and it'll fall apart. It's almost too much. You know, they're over-engineering it. And so what we've seen is that the groups that have been successful have found a rhythm that works for them and works for their purpose, given where their purpose has evolved to. So if you kind of come out of a mentoring relationship thinking, I've got to meet with my mentor every month, even though we're now in this new transition phase, or in a group, I have to meet with my group every three weeks or four weeks because that's what we've been doing. I think that's where often, you know, for groups to become self-directed or relationships to become self-directed, it's really important to help people step back and go, okay, so what does it need to look like now given what your goals are? Maybe once yeah. a quarter is good. Maybe once a year. I have, one, I have one group they meet once a year and it's fantastic. It works for them, right? So yeah. I think that's a, such a key thing on the closure piece. The other piece is don't let perfect, don't wait for perfect connection time. Yeah. Sometimes you have to just have good enough connection time. Yeah. So I have um, a mentor who said to me, who reached out, like, I need your help. I can't, I can't do an hour and a half 
you know, they'd committed to 90 minutes every six weeks. I can't do 90 minutes every six weeks. So, well, what can you do? Yeah. Right. And it's, it's, you don't want to, you don't want to shortcut the mentoring process and have it become something else. But remember that ongoing with, um, in order to have ongoing success in a mentoring relationship, you have to build the relationship and work on the learning. And so sometimes it's, you know, you have this conversation, we can't meet as often, but let's continue to connect as we can. And it's a quick text mm -hmm. or it's, Hey, um, just checking in. I want to know how that meeting went. Give me a quick update, that kind of thing where um, you are continuing to share with your mentoring partner that you value the relationship. You're continuing to build some trust and some continuity and maybe you can't do the perfect, mm -hmm. um, but you do the good. Yeah. Um, well, I think of that it's the same with groups, you know, and Lisa, you and I are in a peer group together. And I think if we waited for it to be perfect attendance to get together as a group, we would never meet. But we um, made an agreement up front um, that it was that was one of our kind of working agreements as a group to say, join if you can. If you can't, it's OK. And and there hasn't been any uncomfortableness. Some people have been able to be more consistent than others. Um, but you know, those that haven't, haven't felt like they're not part of the group because they haven't been able to participate um, to the same degree. So I think all of those things are really critical when we're, when we're setting up programs to be successful. Yeah. Yeah. When you have your intentionality conversation too, it's also really important to say, you know, I commit to you to try my best and I'm going to need grace when I can't make it. Mm -hmm. um, and then to have that agreement back and forth. It's a simple thing, but it really makes a big difference. So let's look at the group coach success pillars. Is that a good place to go? Yeah? Yeah, sure. Because um, people ask me this all the time because I think group coaching is, is sort of one of those spaces that's still pretty new for a lot of people. And um, people say to me, so what do you have to have in place to really make sure that it works? So that's the arc of the relationship. The relationship's going to go from, you know, you know, getting to know each other and then we get to the, you know, the kind of the conclusion reflection piece. What has to be anchored into the relationship um, to make it work or into the group to make them work? So for me, the first one is clear goals. You have to have shared goals around what it is you're trying to achieve. And so, you know, in our programs, we're working with leaders. The shared goal is usually I got to take leaders from here to here. Whatever the context, it doesn't matter, but we're going from here to here. So there's personal goals. There's always a behavioral goal in our program because that's what we're really helping leaders um, expand and develop. So clear goals and, and shared goals amongst the group. It doesn't mean that once you've got that one shared goal, their individuals don't have different goals. They will. But you need to have some commonality around why this group is coming together in the first place and what you need them to be moving the needle on in order to accomplish. Then there's the structure piece. So structure to me looks like your design. It's the how many sessions is it going to be? How long is it going to be? What's the pre-work commitment? What's the post-work commitment? How many members are in a, in a group? And, you know, I think there's lots of research that you can read about the ideal group size, just like the ideal team size. My world, it's eight. That is the number. You can go a little bit lower, you can go a little bit higher. In group mentoring, I actually like to go lower because in group mentoring where you have a mentor with you know, uh, a number of um, uh, mentees to work with at once, I personally like a four to five size group for a mentor to be able to manage. But if you're talking group coaching with an experienced group coach, eight, you're pushing it at 10. And you know, we, we have clients that really, you know, they, they're very insistent on 10. You can do it. You need to expand your, you know, depending on how much time you're allocating, allocate a little bit more time. The bigger the group, the more you want to sort of allocate a bit more time. So thinking through structure is really important. And then the last piece of the puzzle for me is commitment. And commitment is on a couple of levels. There's the commitment of the participants. So in a group coaching program, unlike a training group um, where you know somebody's here for one session and then oh maybe they they stepped out and they're going to take the the second part of the training in a couple of weeks and it can stand alone okay that you know the in and out is often okay and you you can accommodate it I would say with group coaching and especially when you're on a journey around people shifting behavior and moving through goals and it's coaching the participants themselves are part of the program they bring content. So mm. when they miss a session, it impacts everybody's learning. 
So you need the commitment of the participants to be willing to commit to the dates once the schedule is set and once those dates are set, they need to commit to that. And of course, the manager who supports that individual in the program has to be fully aligned to that. So you need the manager's support to make sure that they're not there going, ah, oh, no, you don't need to be there. Like, go on to this meeting instead. So commitment is really critical at both those levels. And then obviously the organization, you know, making sure that the organization is creating the space to allow people to do any sort of overtime group coaching experience. Our program, if I use the example of our, um, our anchor program, it is um, when we run it live, we tend to like to run it every six weeks. Six weeks on a time spread seems to give people enough time to go and action the things they need to action, see what the results are, and then come back and do it. And I have to tell you, this is a side funny story, but um, we've always run our programs every six weeks. And I've noticed over the years that I've had more feedback on our evaluations that say, you know, the frequency of this program was a little, a little much. Maybe instead of having it every four weeks, you should make it every six weeks. And I'll say to the group, guys, it has been every six weeks. It's just that people are so slammed and so busy. It can feel like it's, it's more frequent than it actually is because time seems to go so quickly, right? But every six weeks, so you can imagine if somebody misses a session, now it's 12 weeks that they haven't seen, you know, haven't been part of the group experience and how reintegrating them back in takes time. This is what you miss. This is what you're, you know, um, going to have to catch up on. So thinking about your pacing, but also the commitment to make sure people really understand that they will affect the learning of those in their group. I find is a, is a critical success pillar. So those are my three big ones. I mean, there's lots of layers underneath yeah. each one, but and I'm, I'm wondering, Lisa, does that parallel at all, do you find, with the, the sermon that you need to give people who are going into mentoring relationships at all? 100%, both for the one-on-one -on -one and, and for the group mentoring. You know, to me, the, what, I, what I, he, I see often is somebody will say, well, you know, I don't have any issue this time, so I, and, I, and I'm busy, so I can't make it. And actually, what their presence is, is accountability to others. I don't think, I think, you know, maybe it's our own um, sense of, imposter syndrome or humility or whatever we want to call it, that I don't think we fully appreciate it in the context, what the value of our participation means to others. Mm -hmm. First of all, sometimes it's the only safe space in a work context where people feel like they can show up authentically. And so to have other people there is, is a bonus. But also we talked about that, we talked about how much you know, people learn from one another. So the commitment isn't just to one's own learning, it's really to one another that can be really, really central. Um, and the same is really true in a one-on-one -on -one context for mentoring relationships. It, it, it's a relationship that has to be co-created by mentor and mentee, which is the structure, with the goals of the mentee in mind, skills, uh, knowledge, development, competencies, and then the commitment of both parties really to building that relationship. So that's really, really central. You know, um, great question that just came in as well. Is it imposter syndrome or self-absorption that keeps people from participating and contributing to peer growth? Oh, such a question. Yes, is the answer. Is that an, I know that was an either or. <laughs> I, think it's a, I think it can be a little bit of both. And I think it also can be, an, an, it depends. What's your reaction to that question, Glein? Well, you know, it's funny because when, it, when we, um, I've been really fascinated lately with this tool that we've been using. It's become, I'm becoming a little bit obsessive about it, to be honest, everybody, because you know how you get um, when you start working with something and then you start everything you look at, you're like oh, looking at it through a lens. I think, um, I think some of it is insecurity, imposter syndrome. I was having an interesting conversation um, this week with a colleague of mine who was doing some inclusion uh, I won't call it training, but some inclusion consulting with our team on making sure that the, the processes and the things that we do in our group pro program are inclusive. And, um, you know, she was, she was sharing from her perspective how, you know, sometimes people come in and you don't know that they're holding themselves back. Um, because, you know, your lens being, and in my case, a white woman, um, you know, that's not something that I've ever thought about or, or been concerned about. And so, you know, this idea of imposter syndrome, I think some of it, it's got a lot of contextual layers to it. So sometimes, yes, maybe people feel, you know, that they, they don't have anything to add or anything to say, or they don't want to 
um, speak up or they're uncomfortable. Sometimes there's another layer that's around, um, you know, experiences that they've had in the past when they have spoken up or, you know, who's listened to their voice and who hasn't. Um, but then the other thing I notice is energy. So when we do our team uh, coaching work, one of the tools that we use a lot with teams is an energy tool. And it looks at how teams are general, individuals, it starts with the individual. How are you generally motivated? What gives you energy? What, you know, what do you love doing? And um, what's fascinating when you put a group or a team through that and you look at their collective energy is you see how a collective energy can shift things. So sometimes I've seen in our groups, I have seen individuals that I would say, they just don't have a lot of energy from hanging out with other people. It's not where they get their juice. It takes a lot of energy for them to show up and be part of a team. They're much, they're much happier kind of like doing their own thing or, and even if they're leaders, like it's not even about leading a team. It's just that they, they would rather, you know, be focused on getting their work done or, you know, they, they like strategic thinking. So if the opportunity to write a strategic plan or go to their group coaching session comes up, they will have more of a tug of war about which one to go and do than those individuals who really enjoy sort of that collaborative being part of a group type experience. So I've noticed that um, the, the, the people that kind of don't love the group stuff as much or struggle with the group stuff as much, it's often because they've got less affiliating energies than the people who have really high affiliating energies. So that's, that's super interesting right, to watch that sort of yeah. out. And you have to kind of work with that individual to say, hey, look, you know, you're your insights are really needed and what's the energy that you can tap into that's important to them that they are going to bring in the group and i will say that the reason why i love group coaching um, so much is i just love tapping into peer pressure um, because usually in a group you're going to have those people who absolutely are not they're not going to be the person who doesn't do their homework and if they are that person who shows up not doing their homework it's the last time they will ever not do their homework because they don't want to, you know, be seen at another level within their peer group. So, so I think, yeah, some of it's, you know, some of it's um, imposter syndrome, some of it's other stuff that's going on that I think we have to really understand and dig deeper and look at even our programs and how we've set up our programs. And I know Lisa, that's a lot of the interesting work that you're doing, um, you know, in that space. Um, and then the third is how is this person wired and motivated, you know? Yeah. Well, and that's really the hallmark of a good coach or good facilitator is yes. to really be able to draw out the introverts and the extroverts and to draw out the people who have the different, uh, you know, uh, energy styles or um, types of energy and to recognize where there is a flaw in the underlying agreements and make those corrections as possible, you know, as, you know, as often as possible. It's interesting because sometimes the tendency with that a skilled facilitator or a skilled coach, you know, is the, the, the peers of the group are, are eager to support one another. And, you know, you might say what your issue is if you're on the hot seat line. And I'd say, yeah, absolutely. For me too. You see, when this happens for me, this, I'll, yeah. this you know, I'm going on and on about me. How often? I mean, that happens all the time, right? Yeah. <clears throat> and when you have a skilled coach or a skilled facilitator, excuse me, <clears throat> um, it really having that ability to regulate that can be really, really important. Um, I skipped over um, something. That, oh, go ahead. I was just going to say, though, I think, you know, because I think what's underpinning this to me and, and um, you know, which it's not one of my bubbles, but it's sort of like the underpinning of it is that group leadership, that group facilitation, that group coaching, the expertise of the individual who's going to be running it and i think when we when we flip that over to an individual piece it really is about you know the, the the skills of that mentor you know to be able to have the kinds of conversations both of those that that to me is almost like a foundational piece for whether you're looking at a group program or an individual program you really need to make sure that the people that you are having um kind of take that role are skilled and, and ready to go and and have the the tools that they need to be successful yeah, for sure. Well, let's see what the challenges of our uh, of the folks on the line are. We have a, another poll question that I'm going to launch for you right now. Um, 
And our question for you is, what are the biggest challenges to creating an effective mentoring or group program, group coaching program that you've seen or experienced? Is it lack of executive support, lack of chemistry, poor trust or lack of psychological safety, leaders too busy to participate, lack of focus goals or goals for participants, all of the above, or something else? And if it's something else, let us know that in the um, chat as well, please. Yeah, and then Lisa and I can share all of our tips on how we overcome all of these things. <laughs> yeah, 100% all the time, right? Yeah, all the time. <laughs> well, you know what I have to say is, as I've gotten, in, I maybe it's in my old age, but I do get crankier about certain things. So, I, so we don't run into a lot of these problems anymore. But I would tell you, early, early on, when I was when I was a much more accommodating, I probably did run into almost everything on this list. But yeah, you you live and you learn. Right. Absolutely. Um, just a few more. I'm gonna give a few more uh, people just another minute to answer. Um, yeah, it's interesting. I do think that the the benefit of having a skilled coach or um, facilitator, uh, and you know, it's different in the in the group mentor. Even mentors need these, this training, even though they're not necessarily coaches uh, by uh, by training, is really to learn how to facilitate the the group needs uh, and to address this, and not to just accommodate, accommodate, accommodate. Um, because you really do need to stay on track. Okay, I'm going to end the polling. So I'll give you five more seconds for the few who have not yet responded, if you're able to do. I know there's a couple people calling in by phone. And then let's share those results. So too busy, says half, half the group. Um, not a surprise, right? Um, uh, poor trust, lack of psychological safety, and lack of focus coming in a second and third, really tied for second and third. Um, and then a bunch of uh, all of the above really looks like we hit the nail on the head here, uh, going with our options. Um, and then one response which says, I haven't been part or led a group, so I can't uh, comment. So what, what do you make of this? Um, well, look at like 50 percent said leaders are too busy to participate. And I do think that that really comes into where does this fit in terms of the priorities for the business? And I think often for those of you that are on the call, I know we've got a mix of external coaches and consultants and then internal um, folks who are looking at programming here. I think one of the big mistakes that gets made when we launch learning programs and organizations is that we are not really clear on how this is going to drive the business forward. And then mm -hmm. we're asking, and then we're asking business leaders to give up their time to come into a program where they don't even, where, where they're not seeing the direct link. So um, one of the things that I would suggest if that's what you're encountering is I would just kind of go back and check and see how are you taking the story from business strategy to how this program is going to support us getting to our business strategy to this is why I want to do this particular program. And so for us, you know, I'll use my example of, you know, leadership and when we're working with leaders, that's always my first question is what's your business strategy? And, and then therefore, if that's the business strategy, if these are the priorities for the business, how are leaders going to have to show up in order to do that? Because your behavior drives your results. So what are the behaviors leaders are going to need? And that's invariably when you'll hear people say, well, they need to be more, you know, collaborative or we need to break down silos. We've got too many silos going on and we've got, we've got to get more innovative as a result. And da, 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 da. That's the measure. And then we can kind of bring it down into the program that we're going to do. And because we work on behavior and if somebody can show me a training program that teaches leaders how to change behavior in a one day workshop, I, I'm all for it, but I've never ever seen that in 25 years of working in this space. Behavior change happens over time, so that's what we want to work towards, and we want to measure the behaviors, and we want to have enough time that we can actually see that people have seen a change, that the leaders are consistently demonstrating that change, and that there's a result. And so I think that, like, that's sort of my take. If, if you're struggling with the, um, you know, leaders being too busy, I would wonder if you've got them the right um, approach group on the group coaching the, the thing that I would say to leaders going into our program I say this every time we kick off a program if this isn't helping you move something off your desk we shouldn't be doing this program period it's, it's a coaching program you need to be moving something off your desk if you're not then it's, it's an exercise in it's like an academic exercise theoretical exercise that's not what coaching is about it's about creating movement so 
That, that would be my response. Yeah. What was your take? That's huge. Know? Yeah, that's huge. I, you know, the other thing is, I, you know, a lot of times when we're helping organizations launch mentoring programs, whether they're virtual or live mentoring programs, um, we encourage our internal uh, contacts to do some internal lobbying efforts, um, right? And it's not just, you know, the meeting um, with the leadership team to tell them that this is occurring and how it links to the business strategy, which, by the way, is critical, how it links to the business strategy, but also the individual approach. I might go to you, Glein, and say, you know, Glein, you know, you lead this, this team, and actually, I really need your support. Maybe the support, there's a couple different ways you could support. You could participate in the program, which would be ideal. Here's some talking points on how to talk to your team about it. Here are ways to check in with the participants to find out how it's going, what they're learning. Um, you know, here is you know, a, some, a feedback form. You can ask your, the managers who are, who are managing people who are in the group coaching or the group mentoring program or the one-on-one -on -one mentoring program what they're learning, that kind of thing. So that there's lots of different avenues for involvement. Um, and, uh, you know, the worst that can happen is that they agree to participate and then they either don't participate or they participate so sporadically that it under, under, uh, undermines your program. But the, that communication ahead of time can be really, really essential um, for, um, for the success of a program. Also, so making sure you solicit an executive sponsor for the program who may or may not participate can be really important as well and have them ask if you have one leader who is really in love with the program have them do some of the advocacy for you, for you and you know arm them with the talking points to be able to say i know it's going to feel like it's a lot it's really going to be worth it i need you to participate that kind of thing because it, having somebody do some of that recruiting and some of that advocacy for you can be essential in the leaders too busy um, so we also had lack of focus we had lack of clear goals uh, as items as well what do you make of those um, so, yeah, I'll, I'm just going to pick up on what we were just talking about in terms of that um, executive buy-in and support. One of the best practice pieces that we do with all of our programs is to do an orientation session. And there's a couple of really key components in the orientation session. One is the executive sponsor gets up and stands there. The other is the participants are there with their managers, their reporting manager. And one of the things we do is we obviously we go through what the journey of the program is gonna look like because it's got many components to it and many pieces. But we go through a piece of, here's the expectations for you managers. And one of the expectations always for me is that you make time for your participants to be there because that's mm -hmm. often the biggest challenge. And then, and, and I, I, in the session, I'll say, has anybody got a problem with that? Now's the time to speak up. And, and we will have people, the first time we run a program, there's often some debate about that and discussion about what that means and everything else. Sponsors can reinforce it. And then we have the, the role and expectations of participants. So I found, you know, we, we got lax with one of our new programs where we didn't have that orientation. We just sort of jumped into a new program and immediately we saw the error of our ways. So I think just to kind of close the loop on that, I think that this idea of, you know, how you do it when you're rolling out a program I, the, you know, really think about that orientation piece as a piece of getting that buy-in and making sure that that busy objection is taken off the table because everybody's made the commitment before they even go into the program. So then with clear focus and goals, um, I think that that's where, again, over the years, we used to, with our group programs, we would have the participant really come up with their goal for the program, and we would have kind of a boilerplate thing that, um, you know, certain goals that we thought they would be gaining from the program and we would ask them about that up front. And over the years, as we've, as we've sort of honed our approach and our process, one of the things we've really um, doubled down on a lot is the engagement with their manager around the goals. Because again, remember, most of our programs, we're talking about helping leadership behavior. And what I've really learned over my years of working with leaders on their behavior is, they can do so much on their own trying to shift a behavior, but if the people around them aren't seeing the behavior change, it's gonna be like they've done nothing. So it's mm -hmm. super critical in a behavior change initiative if that's a component of the program that you have stakeholders involved. So um, we've really doubled down on that piece and so have um, up front before the individual actually goes into the group experience. Um, we use assessments, we do one-to-one -one debriefs of those, we do alignment meetings with their managers. 
just really, I think, as you would in any sort of coaching program, um, we want to make sure that there's an alignment between what the manager is looking for and expecting and what the individual thinks they're working on. But the other reason that we're doing that is that we want that manager to start looking for the new behavior. So that's become um, a very kind of core piece to our approach and has been a way that we've been able to really align on goals all the way through. And then we have every single session it's a bookend. What have you done to move your goal? What are you gonna to do to continue to get um, advancement on your goal? Because it's a coaching program. We have programs where we also include individual coaching, which helps people stay focused on their goal. But then also because it's over time and companies evolve and gosh, we've been hit with a pandemic, is the goal you set at the start still the goal you need to be working on or do we need to shift it? There's this ability to be agile with leaders as you go through this kind of experience. Um, and then, you know, it's the measurement on the other end. So we baseline measure with managers. We have touch points with the manager through the program to make sure that we're tracking against the goal to make sure that things are going on. Sometimes people get promoted, they move in with a new manager relationship, we re-onboard. So it's really important that you keep that piece going um, throughout the process because not so much that people don't wanna work on their goals, but I just find that organizations today are incredibly dynamic. And yeah. you know, the, the idea that a leader you know, uh, is going to have exactly the same development goal, even if the goal is the same, the context often changes around the goal. So you're constantly having to kind of recalibrate. What about you? Yeah. What's the, 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 your thoughts on this piece? Yeah, no, same. I think that there, you, ha you really have to have to remember that there, you have, there's no two sessions that are the same. I, it's always amazing when I do do group coaching, you know, you come in with a, if you come in with a particular topic, it takes its own um, flavor in each group, and you really have to be conscious of kind of having that kind of management. So I want to just uh, take a moment before we end, because next time we're going to be talking about shifting behaviors and mindset, and uh, I think it would be useful. I want I want to just give the folks who are here as attendees a chance if something comes to you as something that you would like to know more about that that you'd like for Glyn and I to address when we talk to you next week. Uh, same. Same bat time, same bat channel, as they say. Same, same time, same place. Um, uh, let us know what that is in the chat, please, because we want to make sure to address. But we're going to talk to you a little bit about that. And then the other question that I have, um, and Glenn, I'm going to pose it to you first so that the folks who are on the line can give it a thought um, as well, is what are you taking away from this conversation today? Um, you know what I'm taking away is actually just how... Um, how similar the processes are for a really effective individual mentoring program to a group coaching program. There's, there's so many parallels when you get into this relationship-based approach to developing people. So I think that's my big takeaway is just the, there's a lot of similarities. So I think for organizations, there's lots of ways that if you have a good foundation, you could be applying that, those principles, whether it's one-to-one -one or group or, you know, Big mentoring groups, little mentoring groups. So yeah, and same for me. And the importance of the importance of structure, um, and the the importance of really being attuned, not just to you know, not just to the music, but to the to the harmony, right? And the to the words and the music and the sound and the whole bit of it, um, because the more fluid and responsive you can be, and yet the more true to sticking to what the goals and the purpose are. It really is a balance, but both of those both of those elements are so, so critical for success. We fall so often fall into the trap of thinking that these processes processes, look, I've been talking to you for an hour and already I'm saying it like a Canadian. These processes are um, really just for extroverts. And the truth is it's not. Introverts really can contribute a lot. Um, and it's, it's about being attuned to those different pieces. So um, so that would be that would be my thought. So Again, encouraging folks to um, add your thoughts for what you'd like us to cover, either uh, in the chat or, um, uh, or in the Q&A, or you're certainly welcome to send Glein or I an email, Glein or me an email about that. Um, and technology is failing. Me. There we go. The, we wanted to um, remind you to join us. Are you still able to see my screen? Mine has gone blank. There we go. Um, uh, Glein and I both each have books out in the recent few months. So go ahead and check those out and feel free to be in touch with us between now and next time as well. Any final parting words, Glyn, to our crew here? 
No, I mean, definitely we, we loved kind of getting some of your thoughts from the last session. So hopefully those of you who are on that last session, we've, we've answered some of those rolling questions, but keep them coming. Um, we're really sort of curating this in real time along with you. We've got our framework. So um, look forward to having you back next week and, and being a part of uh, the conversation. Thank you so much, Glyne. Thank you everybody for your participation and we will see you next week. Yeah, sounds great. Bye everybody. Bye.